on this Monday night. We are inside Venezuela, a country in political crisis. As millions flee crushing poverty, the stories of the vulnerable left behind, their hopes and fears if the government falls. Canada is stepping up. The role Canada will play in shaping Venezuela's future. Fear and anger, loss, deep, deep sadness. Bruce MacArthur's terrible crimes detailed in a Toronto courtroom as we learn more about the lives cut short. What investigators have learned from this case that could stop a serial killer? And we go in depth in Alberta. How long can you hang on? Not very long. <laughs> Guarantee you not long. A former boom town now facing layoffs, bankruptcies and foreclosures. We pull together regardless of the, the, the downturn of the economy. Tonight, their message for the rest of Canada. This is The National. For years, members of Toronto's gay community feared they were being hunted, targeted by a serial killer. Well, today, in front of a packed courtroom, prosecutors said they were right. Then they laid out grisly details of Bruce MacArthur's crimes and how he eluded police for so long. Ioana Romiliotis is our lead reporter on this story and was also in the courtroom. A warning, some of the details you're about to hear are disturbing. What we already knew about these men's murders was chilling. Today, it only got worse. These photos among a cache found on Bruce MacArthur's devices. And as the convicted serial killer stared blankly ahead, the Crown described how he killed them in a sickening litany of facts and exhibits. MacArthur's bedroom, where most of the murders took place, the rope he kept by his bed to strangle some of his victims, the metal bar he used to tighten the ligature. Court also heard he took dozens of photos of his dead victims on a fur coat, wearing a fur hat, sometimes with a cigar in their mouth, that he shaved their heads and faces kept the hair and other mementos like a notebook and jewelry. It's really heavy, uh, you know, uh, there's a few uh, tears and, and people I think are just in shock in terms of what they're hearing. Uh, they're not going into too much detail, but they are ex uh, explaining with some detail of the occurrences. So uh, it's, uh, it's just heavy in the room, if I can say that. The indignities continued even after MacArthur hid his victim's body parts in planters at a home where he stored his landscaping tools. Court heard the remains were disturbed after they had decomposed and that MacArthur wrapped and buried a set of remains in this blue container in the ravine area behind the home and buried other body parts in the area as well. This friend was among the stunned friends and family in the courtroom. For me, it's, it's um, a story without an ending, you know. For me, it's, it doesn't bring closure for me personally. It doesn't bring satisfaction at all. It only, you know, poses more questions and more uh, speculation on why. There was no answer to why, but in a wrenching stream of victim impact statements, friends and family members described how gutted they still are. From Andrew Kinsman's sister, Karen Coles, I lie awake thinking about how he was murdered and dismembered by someone he knew. From his best friend, Greg Dunn, I miss you something crazy, my beautiful, amazing friend. From Salim Essen's family, our lives were shattered with the shocking news. We can't come to terms with his savage murder. And from the daughter of Dean Leswick, who never knew her father but hoped to one day. I will now always have to live with knowing I will never have a relationship with my father. I think of the mothers. Reverend Deanna Dudley helped memorialize many of the victims and spoke on behalf of the community too. It's not going away anytime soon. And what is it that is lasting? Fear, anger, um, fear and anger, loss, deep, deep sadness. And Andrew, we expect to hear more victim impact statements in court tomorrow. Okay. Mean, meantime, today, Yuena, we learned more about two men who had encounters with MacArthur and, and survived and escaped. Yes. And one was in 2016. He was a man who met MacArthur for a sexual encounter in his van in a parking lot. He says MacArthur suddenly got very angry and started to strangle him with such force that he wasn't able to swallow for a week. That man went to police, 
Police questioned MacArthur and let him go. The second incident that we heard about and has been reported, when police arrested MacArthur, they found a man handcuffed to his bed. But what's chilling is that today they revealed that MacArthur had folders on his computer with photos of every single one of his eight victims and had a folder set up with this man's name. So it's possible that man could have been next. Wow. Okay, Joanna, thanks very much. You're welcome. Now, much of what we learned today involved gruesome details of how MacArthur's victims were killed. But friends and families also talked about the impact of these crimes and about the men they knew and loved. So we'll look now at the lives they lived. MacArthur is expected to be sentenced by the end of the week. And later in the hour, I'll speak with an expert in serial killings to talk about what lessons investigators can take away from this case. Okay, let's turn now to another developing story, the situation in Venezuela. Adrian is inside the country again tonight. Adrian. Andrew, signs of strife are everywhere here. Hope is really just one more thing that's in short supply. So in a moment, we'll show you firsthand how this political crisis is crushing its people. But first, here's a look at how things changed today. We know that the people of Venezuela are facing tremendous hardship and they need our help. Canada pledged $53 million to help Venezuelans at home and those who fled to neighboring lands. As Ottawa hosted the Lima Group of Countries, dedicated to stabilizing Venezuela and establishing free elections. They recognize opposition leader Juan Guaido as the country's legitimate interim president. So that pits them against Nicolas Maduro, whom they denounce as a dictator clinging to power after a fixed election. Al señor Guaido Marquez. Today, 13 European countries also lined up behind Guaido. At the Venezuelan border, the military knows humanitarian aid is expected to arrive this week. They are under increasing international pressure to let it in and give it to the people. Today, Guaido went further, accusing the Maduro regime of trying to siphon more than a billion dollars from public coffers and illegally move it to Uruguay. If that's true, that kind of cash could do a lot to ease urgent suffering, as we saw all too clearly today. The worse it gets, the more they show up at these gates. Some abandoned by families who are fleeing the country, people who can no longer take care of them. They are the elderly. At this charity, it's just men who've come or been dropped off here. Architects, accountants, waiters once. Political affiliations of their youth vary. But now, there is some unity in that anger. Maduro is a thief and a pothead, everything but a president. Total donkey, offers one. The worst, the worst, his friend chimes in. He should quit now and go wherever he wants. There are stories behind that bitterness. The days they spend here are with unreliable water, not much food, and more worrying, few of the drugs they need to survive. So it's donations that provide them what they have here, but not even money can get them what they really need, especially when you're talking about medicine. The Pharmaceutical Association of Venezuela says 85% of the medications are in short supply, which is why you'll see signs like this, basically telling people how to make their own medicine using vinegar and water to treat infections, because here, that's it. The mother superior looking after everyone, teasing them that Maduro is finished. He's not, of course. She seems to want to will it so. Yo creo que va a mejorar. Hay que, que logremos salir de esto. Sí, 
hay que salir de esto. Ya, esto no se puede. There's such a deterioration, moral deterioration, she says, in every sense of the word. Moral, because there's no respect for anything. They don't respect the grandfathers. She's brave to talk like this. Some approached us to declare if they spoke out critically, they would lose their pension. It's happened already, we're told. That voice you hear? That's Juan Guaido, the man who would be president. He was somewhere in Caracas speaking publicly, and every word taken in so seriously here. As Guaido spoke about protecting the rights of each individual and a new day in the history of Venezuela, something just changed in this man. What's wrong, she asks. He tells a story about Chavez's men killing his son and then listening to Guaido speak, becoming afraid he'll be stopped or arrested and that the promised aid won't arrive. This man is alone. His children have left the country, but he wasn't well enough to join them. This is the Venezuela left behind. Now, thousands of kilometers away, more than a dozen nations gathered in Ottawa today to send a message to Maduro and really to address Venezuela's plight. They're putting more pressure on Maduro with yet another demand that he step aside. But as David Cochran tells us, the future of Venezuela may just rest in the hands of its military. Far from the chaos in Venezuela, a message from the man who would be president. Juan Guaido urges them to increase pressure, but the countries gathered here need no convincing. El momento para la transición democrática en Venezuela. Justin Trudeau spoke with Guaido on Sunday to pledge Canada's support. Today, his foreign minister chaired a gathering of countries calling for Maduro to go. Venezuela, under Nicolas Maduro's rule, has descended into chaos. But as Freeland and Peru's foreign minister were outlining their plan, protesters masquerading as journalists interrupted. Hands off Venezuela! Hands off Venezuela! The Lima Group is unlikely to take that advice. Their demand that Maduro quit isn't new, but one detail is. They want the army to switch sides. We are indeed calling on uh, the military of Venezuela as we call on all Venezuelans and as we call on all governments of the world to recognize Juan Guaido as interim president of Venezuela. A shift in military support could shift Venezuela's balance of power. We need more and more pressure on the top of the army force and in the top of the political dictatorship. International pressure is also ramping up, as key European countries have formally recognized Guaido. We are seeing already some people from around Maduro uh, deserted. We urge everyone around Nicolas Maduro to turn their back on him. Everybody is helping and this is a fight of the free world against Maduro. The free world, but not their militaries. The plan for now is to stick with forceful words rather than the use of force. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. So as the world turns more attention to this embattled country, what lies ahead for Venezuela? We're staying here on assignment to follow that and bring you a view of what might just be history in the making. Now to a CBC News investigation. The Canada Border Services Agency's duty is keeping Canadians safe, so it's in the agency's power to detain, search, even deport. But when it comes to maintaining checks and balances, it is the only major federal law enforcement body in Canada with no civilian oversight. In many cases, the CBSA investigates itself. CBC News has now obtained data that reveals just how often that happens. Our senior investigative correspondent, Diana Swain, explains. Advocates for undocumented workers block the gates and try to stop a deportation. They don't realize border agents have already moved a Montreal woman through a rear fence and put her on a plane back to Guatemala. Carrying out deportations is one of the duties of CBSA. But in this case, Lucy Granados was still injured from what she says happened weeks earlier during her arrest at her apartment. I heard a male voice saying, Madame, Madame, Madame. And then the line went dead. 
Mary Foster got a call from Granados the morning four border officers arrived. She was grabbed by the back of the neck. Her arm was twisted behind her back. She was slammed into uh, the table and then onto the floor. Reached in Guatemala, Granado says nearly a year later, she still only has partial use of her left arm. They grabbed me like an animal, she says. I don't know why they treated me like that. Montreal doctor Nazila Betash examined Granado's medical file. She had a traumatic injury probably during the time of the arrest, which basically damaged the nerves in her cervical spine and subsequently caused her arm to become paralyzed. At least one officer later claimed in internal reports some force was necessary. Who's right? Well, the CBSA gets to decide that because it's the only major law enforcement body in Canada that still investigates itself. There is no outside oversight. Now, CBC News has obtained documents through an access to information request that provides a rare glimpse at just how often the agency is investigating its own. Between January of 2016 and July of last year, CBSA investigated 1,200 allegations of misconduct against its own staff. Alleged offenses include neglect of duty, criminal association, and excessive use of force. Some specifics alleged in the data, smuggling, accessing confidential information on an ex-girlfriend, even an employee with a hit list of colleagues who'd crossed him. We don't know if anybody was disciplined, if anybody was fired. No. We showed the list to Toronto immigration lawyer Joel Sandala. I hear accounts from clients on a regular basis about treatment at the hands of CBSA officers. But why do you believe outside oversight is necessary? It is difficult for me to imagine another kind of agency in Canada uh, that operates using firearms uh, with the authority to detain, arrest and detain individuals uh, has simply no way to be challenged or questioned in a public way about the uh, conduct that they've engaged in. Better civilian oversight of the For the past three years, the federal government has been promising to bring in oversight. There are some anomalies here in the system uh, that we have to correct. Granados and her supporters aren't waiting. They've decided to file a human rights complaint directly with the United Nations. This is a big agency, Ian, over 14,000 staff. They had wide-ranging responsibilities. But because there's no oversight, we don't know how many of the complaints filed against those staff were determined to be founded or not, or what action was taken. The public only typically finds out when criminal charges are laid, and that has happened. And so let's talk more about this lack of civilian oversight. Well, the federal government initially started down the road of introducing legislation, then it abandoned it. And the government says it's trying to make sure that whatever system CBSA gets doesn't result in overlap or duplication of process. Now, Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale would not agree to an interview, but his office says he is still committed to bringing in oversight. But consider what that means. Drafting legislation, getting it through committee, getting it passed, getting it royal assent, all of that before the House rises for the election campaign, which is going to be very tight timing, Ian. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Renewed concerns tonight about railway safety in this country. Three CP crew members are dead after a freight train derailed in the Rocky Mountains. And tonight, the union says the train was traveling out of control, speeding down a hill before the fatal crash. It happened early this morning near Field. That's just west of Banff, close to the BC Alberta border. And that's where we find our Aaron Collins. The crash site is unsettling. Train cars so mangled it's difficult to tell where one stops and the other begins. These cars hauling grain west left the tracks on a bridge plummeting 60 meters to the frigid river valley below, killing three CP workers. Conductor Dylan Paradis, engineer Andrew Dockrell and trainee Daniel Waldenberger Balmer. The union representing those workers says the train was a runaway, going 75 kilometers per hour, twice the speed limit, before crashing. It isn't clear just what caused this train to lose control and derail, but it isn't the first time that's happened on this stretch of track. Just last month, a train left the tracks in nearly the same spot. Well, no one died in that crash, but this former Transportation Safety Board investigator says a second crash so soon raises questions. 
if you've got two incidents that might be similar, that's worth looking into. Like what are, what are the uh, safety features in place to ensure this doesn't happen again? The union has questions too, saying too many of their members are dying. Eight rail workers have died in Canada since November 2017. We hope that the government of Canada, as well as the rail industry as a whole, uh, sees this incident, this accident as a wake-up call. For its part, CP says today's crash will be fully investigated and that there's no threat to the public safety and there are no dangerous goods involved. Transportation Safety Board investigators are on the site of the crash. The TSB will provide an update in Calgary tomorrow. Aaron Collins, CBC News, near Field, BC. Here are some of the developing stories we're watching tonight. Alberta is in the grip of a deep freeze. Environment Canada has issued an extreme cold warning for nearly the entire province. It's way colder than it normally is, man. Like, I am just not used to this kind of cold. It's absolutely brutal. Sure is. In southern Alberta, temperatures hovering around minus 30, and with the wind chill, it feels more like minus 45. Temperatures that low put people at risk for frostbite and hypothermia. The deep freeze is expected to continue until Wednesday in southern Alberta and in the north. It's expected to last until Friday. And now... More legal trouble for U.S. President Donald Trump. According to several reports, the Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office has subpoenaed Trump's inaugural committee. Prosecutors are seeking records related to the committee's donors and finances. A spokesperson for the committee says the subpoena is being reviewed and they intend to cooperate. Here's what else we're following tonight. On The National, the governor of Virginia refusing to resign over that racist yearbook photo. What the growing controversy says about race in America. And as we learn more about how police stopped Bruce MacArthur, a criminologist tells us what investigators can learn from this grisly case. And this week, we're going in-depth on the future of Alberta. Tonight, I'll take you to Drayton Valley, Alberta, a town built on oil with a message for the rest of the country. There are a lot of people, you know, you've seen them on TV who, who don't like pipelines. Exactly. They don't want pipelines. Exactly. What do you say to that? Well, again, then, we stop the transfer payments. We stop the donation to the rest of Canada. Keep it for Alberta. Whether it's worth a thousand words or just leaves you speechless, this racist yearbook photo has put Virginia Governor Ralph Northam under increasing pressure to resign. So far, he's resisted. But as Paul Hunter tells us tonight, even the governor's own Democrats are having a hard time buying his multiple explanations. In Richmond, Virginia today, a demand echoed throughout the state. Democrat Ralph Northam needs to step aside now as state governor. It's all about an unsettling photo from Northam's medical school yearbook page in 1984. In his section, this one. Someone in blackface, someone else in a Ku Klux Klan costume. The clear implication, one of these two is Northam. We have called for the resignation. We hope that's what the governor does. I think that would obviously be less pain for everyone. Northam said today he wants more time to decide his next step. Well, good afternoon. On Saturday, Northam held a bizarre news conference. The day after he'd acknowledged he is in that photo, Northam had second thoughts. I'm telling the truth today, that was not my picture. He then insisted that despite his new certainty on that, there is another time. That same year, I did participate in a dance contest in San Antonio, in which I darkened my face as part of a Michael Jackson costume. I used just a little bit of shoe polish to put under my or on my cheeks. And the reason I used a very little bit is because I don't know if anybody's ever tried that, but you cannot get shoe polish off. All of it a reminder of this country's never-ending struggle with race. It was Virginia two summers ago where white nationalists staged that protest in Charlottesville that left one woman dead and Donald Trump seemingly defending some of the protesters as fine people. Just last month, this photo emerged from 2005 of Florida's Secretary of State dressed as a survivor of Hurricane Katrina. He promptly resigned. 
And even in that old yearbook with Virginia's governor, there are other students on other pages in blackface, underlining whoever's behind that blackface and under that hood was hardly alone. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Next on The National, we go in-depth in Alberta. As the province decides its future in two elections this year, we begin a special series hearing from Albertans. First, I'll take you to Drayton Valley, once one of Canada's richest towns, now dealing with a devastating downturn. And Bighorn Country, home to gorgeous vistas. But the province's plan to protect it is proving beyond controversial. Aaron Collins takes us inside that debate. It's about more than just a park. We're sitting there and we're watching our federal government taking away uh, um, our ability to make a living through the oil and gas stuff that's going on and then we got now a provincial government that's working to take away the, uh, our access to the land. We've got people that are, aren't paying their bills right now. We've got homes being foreclosed upon. Last December, on the steps of the provincial legislature, an Alberta oil town delivered 6,800 letters addressed to Justin Trudeau. Their message, low oil prices are hurting families, and something needs to change now. It is a message being heard across the province and getting louder as both a provincial and federal election is coming up. This week, we're going in-depth in Alberta, the challenges the province faces and what lies ahead. But let's start with those letters and that message from Drayton Valley. It's a town of just over 7,000 people, about a 90-minute drive southwest of Edmonton. We wanted to find out what residents say their governments need to do. This used to be a boom town. Ever since they struck oil here in the 1950s, Drayton Valley enjoyed the ups and occasional downs of life on the oil patch. But they've never seen anything like the current downturn. It's lasted more than four years. It started with the collapse in the international price of oil, but what's made it far worse is how little Alberta is getting for its oil from the U.S. People here say new pipelines to other markets are the lifelines this town needs to survive. You just see a, a slow trick like every month, it'll be, oh, there's another bankruptcy, there's a, another person close their doors. The mayor, Michael Dirksen, says when he was growing up, he heard there were more millionaires here per capita than any other place in Canada. As recently as 2012, a newspaper article described the town as having jobs galore. Not now. You build up to a certain capacity to, to try to handle some of it mm -hmm. um, to the best of your ability, and then you just have the, the rug pulled out from under you, and uh, not really due to the economic climate that we're in, it has to do with the, the uncertainty that's being created by government policies. What people in Drayton Valley want the rest of the country to know is how important oil is for the Canadian economy. That if Alberta does well, so does Canada. Early morning at the Drayton Valley Bakery. It's busy here and it's easy to forget what's happening around town. Keith Jameson is one of the regulars, stopping here on his way to work. But that work, a mechanic shop, could close any day. Talking to some of the boys, they get a project, work, and then it runs out. They get a few days, and that's it. That's what's keeping us going is catering. Tell me a little bit about this business. It's a repair business. We look after a lot of uh, oil fleets, mm -hmm. a lot of personal people. Yeah. Jameson's first shop opened in 1979, and he says over the years, economic slumps were actually good for his business. People would need to keep older cars on the road, but now there are fewer people and less money. How long can you hang on? Not very long. <laughs> Guarantee you, not long. I say we've lost 2,500 to 3,000 in the community, not necessarily right in town, but that's my opinion. And when you lose that many, then the town becomes overserviced. There's too many shops. Jameson is down to one full-time employee. 
He's depleted his savings to try to keep this shop going. Five years ago, when the economy was still strong, he was relying on this place for his retirement. I should have walked away then. Tried to get, I would have had more equity, possibly at that time, than I have now to go. I have nothing now, next to nothing. We've all seen hard luck stories in small towns, but the difference here is people say there's a way to fix this. The pipeline. Get that oil flowing east and west. Get it out. That's what we need. And then, if it flows, there's other people that are going to be employed, right from manufacturing through to well servicing. It is going to build again. But there are a lot of people, you know, you've seen them on TV who, who don't like pipelines. Exactly. They don't want pipelines. Exactly. What do you say to them? Well, again, then we stop the transfer payments. We stop the donation to the rest of Canada. Keep it for Alberta. That's how I feel. Nobody wants to help us. Why should we help them? These trucks should be out in the oil fields. Instead, they sit idle and rusting. How different would this shop have looked two years ago? Probably two or three more trucks in it. Yeah. Or they're all out. And like Jameson, Gary Nelson has been in business here since the 70s. Mm -hmm. These sleek, on, expensive trucks are a sign of his success, but being parked here is a symptom of the slowdown. With oil prices so low for so long, petroleum companies are spending a lot less. And how long has it been like this? Um, two years, three years, and it's just getting worse. And you can, you can handle it for a while, but it's, uh, and these are nice trucks, but they're going to stay nice because they're going to be staying in here. But in a cyclical business, maybe the cycle will turn. I, I can't see it turn. They just don't seem to want to get any action for us. They're trying to step on us every which way they can. Got the parts for this engine now? When Nelson says they, he's not just talking about government, but also average Canadians. A common complaint here is about people back east who are opposed to a pipeline from Alberta and rely instead on imported oil. If we could get some oil to market, uh, send it east, rather than bring in Saudi Arabia oil, use our own oil. Canada's got to get together rather than work apart. Like, I mean, why would we buy oil from Saudi Arabia when we've got tons over here? So if we were to come back here next year or in a couple of years, what would we see in Drayton Valley? If nothing changes, well, you'll, feel, you'll see a lot less tax base coming out of here, tax money. Uh, a lot of the shops will be shut down. Motels are shutting down. Restaurants are shutting down. Yeah. Well, it's depressing because, I mean, a lot of these people that you've been with forever are having trouble. Turns out motels are a pretty good measure of how things are going here. In boom times, Drayton Valley's population would swell with temporary workers. The Motel 8 would be full. But these days, occupancy is down by 80%. Some of the staff have left town. Those who remain, including the manager, Rayla Beaucher, have to do a little bit of everything. During the low season, I have to work at the front desk. One time, I worked 40 hours a week here wow. at the front desk. And at the same time, I was cleaning rooms, especially if we only have 10 rooms. Mm -hmm. No need to bring the housekeepers in. Le Beaucher has resisted offers to move to other, busier locations. She still has hope that things might turn around. I love Drayton Valley. This is my home. This is my town. And people here are so nice, very friendly, and we pull together. Look at now, we have to serve our community dinner just to give us the, the optimistic that we are happy, like we are resilient. As soon as you start talking about the dinner tonight, you, you smile. Well, because it's, 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 it's a good for your heart, right? It symbolizes friendship, and we pull together regardless of the, the, the downturn of the economy. <laughs> This community dinner started with just 30 people. Now more than 300 turn out. Is that amazing? Yes. Each month, a different business contributes money and time. 
and tonight it's Le Beaucher's Motel. This is a town that was built on oil and the affluence and independence that came with that. But now people here say they need some help from the rest of Canada to get those pipelines built. And they're not sure what they have to do to get it. There's another political battle being waged in Alberta. On the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains, the fight is over the future of an area called the Bighorn. It is a beautiful slice of Canadian backcountry, northeast of Banff, that the NDP government wants to turn into a provincial park. The proposed plan would impose stiffer rules around things like off-roading and camping to better protect the sensitive wilderness. Environmentalists are on board, but some people who use the area are fighting back. Aaron Collins shows us why. The views are breathtaking here in the remote Bighorn area of Alberta's Rockies. Stunning vistas and rugged terrain that attract people from around the world. Originally from Switzerland, Alan Ernst moved here 20 years ago. And that is quite the view. Yep. That's why we came here. <laughs> so I really enjoy the area and the peace and quiet. Yeah. Uh, so do our guests. The eco lodge Ernst runs relies on the Bighorn's unspoiled wilderness. Something he says is being eroded by an influx of dirt bikes, quads, and campers. There's been a lot of damage defacing of the land. Um, it's a bit of a free for all. Right. Uh, so people come out here and, you know, becomes party central for some. Well, that party can spread all the way to the shores of Abraham Lake, near the headwaters of the North Saskatchewan River, a place where a unique natural phenomenon, methane gas trapped in the ice, draws curious bubble hunters from around the world. Protecting it is why Ernst likes a plan to turn this area into a series of provincial parks. A move dozens of scientists say would better protect the Bighorn, but that Ernst says has been used to stoke simmering political divisions. You know, kind of right wing, left wing, everybody is, is kind of um, insisting on their point of view and not willing to listen to the other side whatsoever. <laughs> It's an allegation that cuts both ways. The largely conservative residents here bristle at suggestions they're damaging the area, insisting off-roaders maintain the trails that wind through the Bighorn. You're really the steward of these paths. Oh, myself and a big group of us, we've been doing this for over 20 years. But what do you, what do you get out of being out here? Well, it's our backyard. We live, we work and we play here. And uh, it's important that we uh, look after it. It's something we love to do. The worry is change will mean the end of the road for riding these trails, something the province says won't happen. But there's little trust here for progressive governments in Edmonton and Ottawa, seen as out to get conservative Albertans. We're sitting there and we're watching our federal government taking away uh, um, our ability to make a living through the oil and gas stuff that's going on. And then we got now a provincial government that's working to take away the, uh, our access to the land. Proof that a park isn't just a park here in hyper-partisan Alberta, where the roots of long-held political grievances run deep. And with provincial and federal elections looming in the coming months, well, those divisions will likely only rev up. Aaron Collins, CBC News near Sundry, Alberta. This week on The National, we'll have more coverage on the issues facing Alberta. Tomorrow, we bring you Rosie's conversation with Jason Kenney, leader of the United Conservative Party of Alberta, to talk about the difficulties in oil, gas, and getting pipelines built. We'll also be giving some of you a chance to have your say with a special National in Conversation with Premier Rachel Notley. She'll be taking questions in person and on social media tomorrow night starting at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. You can join in live on cbcnews.ca or on the National's Facebook page and YouTube channel. People were in shock to hear what they heard. Um, people were uh, mesmerized by the, the amount of information that was brought forward. A difficult day in a Toronto courtroom as the facts of Bruce MacArthur's crimes were read out loud.
The details are terrible, but still, this case has investigators looking ahead to some of the lessons learned. So, we turn to Mike Arntfield. He's a criminologist and an expert on cold cases and serial killings. I spoke to him earlier today. So, in terms of lessons learned, what is the big takeaway for you that would inform how we think of these kinds of killings and killers in the future? I learned when he was first arrested, for instance, that he had disposed of his victims in a manner that would allow him to continue to access them, to look at them. I mean, dismemberment is rare enough in its own right, but uh, typically it's used for an instrumental purpose, such as to dispose of remains in a way that they won't be found or won't be identified, but to put them, uh, to consolidate them in a place where uh, they would immediately be linked back to him and where he could go and gaze upon them and knew sort of a secret about them no one else did, including the homeowners, to me suggested that we were dealing with a specific breed and a very frightening breed of serial offender known as a homicidal necrophile. So someone who places great erotic and fantasy value on uh, death and on the dead. And based on what we heard today and over the last week in terms of photographs, in terms of posing, in terms of souvenir and trophy collection, uh, in terms of uh, these grotesque vignettes and uh, sort of scenarios that he would put his victims into. This is all as horrific as this sounds, actually quite consistent with what we know about these types of killers. And, and explain that for me. I mean, what the keeping of souvenirs would tell you about the perpetrator. A, a souvenir is an inanimate object, such as a driver's license or a piece of jewelry or a piece of clothing that a killer might keep for, uh, as twisted as it sounds, posterity, something called relational paraphilic attachment. So. Again, a disordered erotic attachment to a victim uh, and to their crime that allows them to relive it through an attachment to a material object. But a trophy is actually even rarer. We're talking about living tissue, hair, uh, skin, uh, a severed digit such as a finger in some cases that's kept, like it sounds, uh, as a trophy, as a, as a signifier of a mission, of a victory, of something they can, they can revisit. For, for all the brutality of MacArthur's crimes, the binding, the staging, the photographs, there was also a very methodical and deliberate attempt to hide what he'd done. What about that strikes you? Well, again, this tells us um, serial offenders typically are broken down into two categories, and they're blanket categories, and they're not without some controversy, but organized versus disorganized. So an organized offender, again, is someone who doesn't necessarily act opportunistically or impulsively, but puts a great deal of rehearsal, uh, mental energy, and fantasy preparation into their crimes. And we see that, again, with these homicidal necrophiles, as well as other uh, very specific types of serial offenders. So, yes, we see he covered his tracks to some degree with uh, the, the use of investigative countermeasures, like using a payphone uh, once initial contact was initiated and, and made, uh, minimizing his digital footprint, knowing that um, many homicide investigations have a digital component. If he could minimize that, uh, the opportunity for police to track him would be, would be limited. So, does it come as any surprise then that police had multiple run-ins with MacArthur over the years, interviewing him, and yet he continued to commit his crimes? Again, this is consistent with, with other offenders, including offenders in Canada who, who have been questioned, including Bernardo, by police during the investigations. And, and, and I say this about cold cases and two law enforcement and two investigators, uh, when a serial... Uh, a serial killer case in particular goes cold, and I'll say uh, the name of the offender is likely already in the file and has probably already been spoken to, and he's been overlooked. He's been falsely screened out or excluded. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. All right. Thank you. Now, first-degree murder carries a mandatory life sentence with no parole for 25 years. So the judge will have to decide whether to give MacArthur a consecutive or a concurrent sentence. Either way, he'll be in prison at least until he's 91. Okay, still ahead on The National. Our moment. Two years ago, he tried to stop a gunman inside a Quebec City mosque. Today, Eamon Durbali accepted a Medal of Bravery and explains why he still wants to give more. The most important is education. And that's why uh, I personally, I want to get involved in this. This is the family of Azadine Soufiane. Two years ago in a Quebec City mosque, he threw himself at Alexandre Bissonnette, trying to wrestle the gun away. But he died when Bissonnette broke free and shot him. Today, his wife and children accepted a medal of bravery on his behalf.
He wasn't the only person honored for acts of courage that night. Survivor Emin Derbali suffered catastrophic injuries, but today said he wouldn't change that. His reflections on that day is our moment. It's a honor for me and my family, and I'm very grateful toward the, the Quebec government. In your mind, what is what is the solution or a solution to fighting hatred in this province? The, the most important is education and sensibilization. So we have to uh, to make a lot of debate uh, with the teenagers. I think that I would be a, a perfect example to show them the result of a hate, a hate crime. I'm happy that I was shot seven times. So they, uh, there are other people that they, they didn't have. Uh, bullets. Uh, it makes me happy for me <laughs> because uh, I don't want uh, to, I don't want other uh, innocent people uh, behind me to receive bullets that I have received. Where will you put the medal? My bedroom. <laughs> you know, Andrew, you listened to Eamon Derbali there and obviously dignity and courage. But the other thing I was thinking is he wants to go into schools and, and give his message about hate crimes and tolerance and just imagine the impact he's going to have on students. Well, and, and impact is, is so the right word, right? Because you think about the impact in that moment. I mean, you, you heard right. He said seven bullets, right? I mean, he was shot seven times. Uh, you think of all the lives he potentially saved in that moment, the precious seconds that he would have bought the other people in that room. And then, as mm -hmm. you quite rightly point out, the impact that he may have for uh, many, many years to come. That's The National for this Monday, February 4th. Good night. Good night.